Hello there, English 215 students. Uh, this is your professor, Michael Martin. I hope um, you're doing well. I'm recording this during Mardi Gras. I hope that everyone is being safe and having a good holiday if you're in Louisiana. Um, and I hope that the course uh, is so far a, an intriguing one for you. Um, the reading for this week, this Ambrose Bierce's Chickamauga, Chickamauga, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is um, one of several readings we'll be doing from this 19th century American realist writer who actually was a Civil War veteran as well. And um, I think you're going to find his work fascinating. Um, you're doing an episode of The Twilight Zone, Zone next week in comparison. I'll talk about that project a little bit more. And you're reading, we're st studying him about three weeks. We also have um, another long reading coming up, The Red Badge of Courage by Stephen Crane, and then Cold Mountain by... Charles Frazier. So what we're doing is basically uh, looking at fiction. We've, we've looked at poetry, we've looked at memoir. The majority of the class will now be on um, fictional portrayals of the American Civil War. I think you'll find these readings um, particularly fascinating. So it, let me rewind though and go back to last week for a second. I gather that the two readings we had are a little confusing. Um, Mark Twain's The Private History of a Campaign That Failed and Kate Chopin's The Locket. Um, I understand that. Um, Twain is rambling. He is doing a sketch of an actual experience he had as a uh, Confederate militiaman in Missouri. Um, we can confirm that, that that is true and that Twain you know, did serve in a regiment. We can't really confirm the details of the rest. And knowing that Tr Twain, who I'm presuming you know from... Um, from Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, maybe some other works you've read, knowing that he indeed stretches the truth in his work and likes to tell a good yarn, I would presume that some of what we read uh, might be fictionalized. For example, he writes about his insubordination of his lieut uh, first lieutenant, um, no, his commander, I'm sorry, remember they skip a first lieutenant, um, and the insubordination is that he, they're about to attack a northern uh, cat held cabin and the men converse and say that they're not going to do so. Uh, the thing that I want you to glean from Twain before we turn our attention to Chopin, um, this will be a quick uh, talk. I'm not going to talk your ear off. I want you to do well on the quiz this week, so I'm going to give you some general information upon that. But the thing I want you to glean from Twain would be a couple things. One, um, note his penchant from storytelling and his use of humor. Um, he makes fun of the um, uh, his fellow regiment men for um, uh, a name that is often associated with the human posterior. Um, so there's the, 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 the fun way that he does that. He also addresses the reader, even in the first sentence, the first paragraph, he addresses the reader's preoccupations or sense of what the Civil War would be like. So there's a wonderful intimacy with, with Twain. Um, I think he tells a good yarn. I think that he, he could tell a story and tell it extremely well. Um, and he knows that it captures attention. He's also doing what we would call a sketch. Characters are set up for us like Commander Joe, um, like his other regiment characters, but they're not really fleshed out. Um, these are basic character sketches that he's, he's establishing as if he were doing a minor character in Huck Finn or something like that. Um, Twain's piece is meant to show how the jocular or funny sense of the Civil War transitioned into... Um, something more serious uh, as the characters, as the, the men, the militia, the 15 men, right? That, maybe that's a good quiz question, right? I'm trying to think of one as I'm talking to you. Um, I think he, he had a short 15 men militia called the Marion Rangers. And uh, maybe that's something we can use. Um, basically, it, w what you want to note from it is that these are brief sketches for comical effect. Um, he wants to show a scene and then not, not, dwell on and he wants to move on. I presume some of these scenes are real. The, the debate is how much of this work is fictionalized. It's a two-part memoir. Um, it's even been made into a film. I haven't seen the film. Um, but the debate is what's real and what's been fictionalized, knowing he wants to tell a good story, knowing that he often stretches the truth from reading his other fiction. We're kind of left with that as one of his, um, his main points. So let's turn our attention briefly to Chopin. I'll introduce you to Bierce and then call it a day. So Chopin is someone, I first, outside of Civil War literature, as someone who's taking um, classes at a Louisiana university that I'd like you to know. 
Um, Chopin is from St. Louis. She lived here, I think, 14 years. She married um, a rice planter. Um, so her works are, are set in Louisiana. And she's what's called a Louisiana local color writer. I know you read Sarah Morgan Dawson and she's Baton Rouge. Um, you also got Vicksburg, so you got something close to Thibodeau. But um, she's someone who's a local color writer. She depicts the local dialect, the local customs, humor, um, the topography of the legion, region as well. Um, you may have heard of her work, The Awakening. Um, you also may know her, well, just to let you know, her shorter fiction does depict um, Grand Isle and does depict other Louisiana sites, often in highly romanticized ways. Um, but what I would tell you um, about this particular piece that's confusing, right? If the private history of a campaign that failed is confusing because you move, I think the confusion is from point to point to point without much um, explanation, right? And then there's um, this one where we get Edmund, who is our protagonist, in Confederate Regiment. So she's a late 19th century writer. She usually doesn't depict as early as the Civil War. Um, Edmund would be a kind of uh, a, 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 the protagonist we're following, who, as you know, in this two part piece, is either engaged or betrothed to Octavie, um, his love interest back. Um, at his home in Louisiana. And in essence, um, as the regiment's looking, and notice in both of our pieces, um, the thing that unites them is that the northerners, ha the northern incursions into southern territory have, have occurred, right? From what I understand about military history, this is when the, the, it, this war went bad for the south, or at least as part of it. Um, and we got that in Vicksburg, right, with, with Mary Lowborough. We got that with Sarah Morgan Dawson in Baton Rouge. Um, this piece depicts the regiment looking out for kind of northern soldiers and engaging in a skirmish. I love the ending of the first part, and I'm not going to give away the ending of both. Um, my discussion question for you this week asks you what is, um, which ending of the three pieces surprised you? Maybe it's this one. It's meant as a surprise. And if you think about the piece, it's a very romanticized one, right? Um, we have Edmund looking at letters from Octavie kind of secretly, he's even got the locket from her that's supposed to protect him um, during during the battle. So you, you, you've you got a very romanticized one. Um, this is not one of Chopin's best known stories. I chose it because it is a Civil War literature piece. Um, but the thing uh, about it, I can't give away the ending. I'm trying to figure a way to, to talk about this with you. Um, Edmund is presumed at the end of part one to be the young man who's lying prostrate on the battlefield with the locket in his hand. Remember the priest and the Negro, we don't like these terms for race, but that's what they used at the time. Find him and you hear the Angelus bells, the Catholic bells, she captures local culture very well. Um, they're ringing, um, he is presumed to be the dead figure and Octavie is then in chapter two or part two wearing black in mourning and riding with a judge Pillier. Um, he asks her to take off the black of her veil I shouldn't even mention that. I'm trying to save the ending. Um, this one does surprise me, um, and it is confusing um, without giving away exactly what occurred. Um, note there were love letters. Note there was some dead on the battlefield wearing a, a, um, a locket. And also note that the judge asked Octavie to take off her clothes of mourning for her, her betrothed, her fiance. So keep that in mind as well. And, and note some of the imagery associated with spring and all those things. All right, so Chickamauga, the one you're reading for today, it's a real southern battle that occurred that our guy, um, I um, Ambrose Pierce was in. Yes, he was, he was in this battle. Um, the thing that I want you to know about him, um, to, I would say two, two literary techniques. A, he's associated with a movement in American literature called American Realism and Naturalism. It was based upon a French uh, novelist called Honoré de, de Balzac. Um, what you really want to know about it is is that they depict the world in its gritty, dark realism as it is. There, there are deaths. There's usually not happy endings. Um, characters are in a social milieu that's a, the equivalent to like a, a Darwinism, for lack of a better term, or social Darwinism, or survival of the fittest. And um, realist works are often done in third person uh, vantage point. So um, you get the boy here, right? We get the boy traveling along this this place. He doesn't understand what occurred. 
Um, so that's the first thing I want you to know about Bierce is he's a realist and this piece depicts that. The second thing, and I, I think this might actually help in some regard, this piece will, is short. It's not going to take you long. The reading for this week is just this story and that's the only reading. Um, but it, it's short, but there's always a feeling of disorientation in his work. And what I mean by that is there can be actual spatial disorientation. Um, there's one about a horseman riding up on a cliff and you're kind of, he's looking up and it's a strange, he's looking for enemy, enemy um, encampments. And you're, you're kind of figuring out, well, what's, what's the orientation physically, spatially? In this one, our disorientation is because we're looking at the world from our third person protagonist, the little boy. Um, and we know that because things are done in, in exclamation points, including the rabbit that he sees. We know that because there's this weird mimic or pantomime of what he sees and experiences as he's on this field and doesn't realize it and um, the world around him. It's third person limited except for a couple things. Notice the narrator will tell us when he or she um, is, is making a statement the boy doesn't know. Look for that, that third person interjection. But um, the thing you want to note about him is that he's disoriented for a reason. Um, I'll let you figure out the disability when you get to the end. And it's a boy on a battlefield without realizing actors around him are in a physical battle while he's playing in the places of his mind, right? He thinks it's a, it's a war game or something like that. Um, and, and note the disorientation. Um, note the realism. I'd also note that Ambrose Bierce, he was a Union soldier, and he was writing this at the time when America was debating whether to go into another military excursion. I believe it was, if I'm getting my history right, uh, the Spanish-American War. Um, and he's, he, this is, his works depict, uh, sorry, my camera went out for a second. His works depict realism to show the horrors of war so that, that the country would not go into yet another war. Um, that it, that some things don't seem to change in American history. But uh, Ambrose Bierce um, wants to depict the, the grittiness of war and all those particular things. Um, I think you'll like the readings I, uh, by him. Um, they're, they're short stories. They're complex, they're psychological, they're in the characters' minds. These are intensely psychological works. Um, I think I might leave the lecture at that. Try to figure out which ending surprised you the most. And I hope you enjoy the readings for this week and the course. Um, have a great day.